Now, our strategies for dealing with the craniocervical syndrome, whether it be caused by instability at the craniocervical junction or at C12, is Hi, I'm Dr. Claire Francamano, and this is my YouTube channel where we talk about all things related to the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and hypermobility spectrum disorders. Today, we're going to be talking about headaches, and there are many, many different causes of headaches that can cause problems for people with EDS and HSD. Today, we'll be focusing on five of the most common types of headaches in EDS and HSD. Now, musculoskeletal headaches are one of the most common types, and these happen when the neck muscles are working overtime to try to stabilize those unstable necks that we see in people with hypermobility. The neck muscles contract, they cause spasm, and this causes pain throughout the head in musculoskeletal headache. Musculoskeletal headaches are associated with forward head posture. This is the position that many of us adopt when we're looking at our phones or working on our computers. And so it's really important to try to avoid that forward head posture. Other things that we can do to try to mitigate these musculoskeletal headaches include ergonomic evaluation of our workstations. We want to make sure we're looking at the screen at the appropriate height and doing postural training for the entire spine to try to keep it nice and straight and upright. We want to try to find strategies to decrease the sympathetic input from the autonomic nervous system, and these include things like meditation, deep breathing, and gentle movement. Trigger point release can be very, very helpful for these musculoskeletal headaches, and also people will use ice or topical remedies with menthol, such as Icy Hot, that can be really helpful. Finally, Botox may be used to alleviate the muscle spasm around the skull or the temporomandibular joint. So migraine headaches are another type of headache that are very common in people with EDS and HSD. These headaches are recurrent, they're typically one-sided, and they last between 4 and 72 hours. They may be associated with nausea, sensitivity to light and sound, and movement, and often the only way to deal with these headaches is to lie down in a dark, quiet room. Migraines are exacerbated by caffeine and dehydration, so these should be avoided by people experiencing migraines. And for acute treatment, medications that are often used include a class of drugs called the triptanes, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and acetaminophen. There is a long list of preventive medications that are recommended if a person is experiencing more than four headache days per month, and these include the beta blockers, topiramate, tricyclic antidepressants, among many others. So you should really speak with your physician about the best options for you if this is applicable to you. The third class of headaches that I'd like to discuss are related to craniocervical syndrome. Craniocervical syndrome includes headache, neck pain, fatigue and weakness, imbalance, difficulties with swallowing or choking, changes in the voice, and brain fog or memory and concentration issues. People may experience ringing in their ears and autonomic dysfunction, including POTS. Now, the craniocervical syndrome may be related to instability at the craniocervical junction, at instability at C12, or to a Chiari malformation. And to evaluate for these, we recommend an upright MRI to look for instability at the craniocervical junction or for a Chiari malformation. If we don't find either of those two things, we typically do a rotational CT scan to look for instability at C12. Now, our strategies for dealing with the craniocervical syndrome, whether it be caused by instability at the craniocervical junction or at C12, is physical therapy. And there is an excellent paper by Dr. Leslie Rusick 
that describes the strategies for physical therapy for stabilizing the craniocervical junction and C12. This paper was published in Frontiers in Medicine in 2023, and I highly recommend it to you. It's really an excellent work describing a consensus opinion about the use of physical therapy for craniocervical instability. A cervical collar may also be helpful to stabilize the neck. I don't recommend that this be used all the time because we really need to work on stabilizing and strengthening and toning those neck muscles. But in situations where there's a lot of jostling around, if you're going to be in a car or you know you're going to be in a situation where your neck is vulnerable, a cervical collar can be very helpful. And finally, if conservative measures are not successful, surgery may be necessary to stabilize the craniocervical junction or C12. Now, increased head pressure may result from a Chiari malformation. It may also result from a failure of the venous system in the head to properly drain the veins in the skull. This presents with brain fog, dizziness, ringing in the ears, and it may be worse with changes in the barometric pressure. Medications that decrease the production of cerebrospinal fluid may help with these headaches, and this may help in making the diagnosis of increased intracranial pressure. If the headache is caused by failure of venous drainage from the head, a person may need stenting of the veins to help keep them open, or if the increased pressure is being caused by a Chiari malformation, which changes the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, then if the medications that decrease production of cerebrospinal fluid are not effective, surgery to decompress the Chiari malformation may be necessary. So those are headaches that are caused by increased intracranial pressure, but we can also see headaches that are caused by decreased intracranial pressure. And these may be caused by something that are called CSF leaks. And those CSF leaks happen because the dura, which holds the cerebrospinal fluid in place around the brain and around the spine, is made of connective tissue. And of course, we know in people with EDS and HSD, that connective tissue is weaker. And so a person may spring a leak and the CSF may just flow out of the dura and then the pressure inside the cerebrospinal space becomes lower. These headaches are typically worse when a person is upright, and they are better when they're lying down. So this is a postural headache, and many times people will just have to spend a huge amount of time lying down because they just can't tolerate an upright position. The headaches are typically associated with nausea. There may be vomiting. People report hearing loss or muffled hearing, and they have sensitivity to light. They may have double vision and neck pain. So in order to evaluate these headaches, we do imaging to localize the leak and see where is the CSF actually uh, emerging from the, sp the spinal space. And um, people use a process called a blood patch in order to decrease or to stop the leak. That blood patch may be used even if you can't find where the leak is coming from with imaging. Sometimes the interventional neuroradiologist will do what we call a blind blood patch and uh, just see whether inserting some blood into, the, into the, the subdural space will allow the uh, leak to heal up. So those are the five most common types of headaches in EDS and HSD. If you're interested in learning more, I have a couple of resources to recommend to you. There's an organization called the Bobby Jones Chiari and Syringomyelia Foundation, Bobby Jones CSF, and they have 
extensive information on their website at bobbyjonescsf.org. So I recommend taking a look at that. Another organization is called the Spinal CSF Leak Foundation, and their website is spinalcsfleak.org. And finally, I'd like to recommend to you the book called Symptomatic, which is a symptom-based handbook for EDS and HSD, edited by myself and Drs. Alan Hakeem and Frazier Henderson and Lansdale Henderson. This book has 11 chapters on headache, and uh, for those of you who are interested in reading more deeply, I recommend it to you. So thank you so much for spending this time with me, and I hope to see you again soon.